We're back with Joel Richardson and we're going to unpack the myth of Helena Sinai. Joel, good to have you with us again. This, is, uh, this has been a treat. Uh, take us rest away, the myth of Helena Sinai. Where did this all begin? Yeah, this is important because, you know, I think when you throw this sort of curveball out to a lot of people, you go, wait a minute, you're saying Mount Sinai is over here in Saudi Arabia, and for all these years, I mean, thousand plus years, we've believed, the church has believed that this, this mountain down here in the Sinai Peninsula, I mean, it's called the Sinai Peninsula, how, how did we get to this? And, um, you know, it, it sort of with any tradition, the longer that it lasts, it just sort of has this air of reliability. And so I think it's important to sort of cut through the history, cut through the myths. Mm -hmm. And so really, I mean, the story is, it's, it's fairly mundane. Um, it's in the fourth century. So we're dealing now, say 300 years after Jesus, after Paul, um, a lot of these Egyptian monks, they started withdrawing from the urban centers, the corruption and all that, and they started retreating to the deserts. This was sort of in imitation of Elijah and some of the, you know, sort of this aesthetic um, movement. You know, Anthony is sort of one of the, the legendary early the desert fathers, they're called. But So these monks start going out into the desert and they're fasting and they're praying and they're trying to, again, imitate these Old Testament prophets, and there was just, I'll just call it a tradition that developed among them, that they just said, this particular mountain down here in Sinai is, we call it Mount Sinai today only because of this ancient tradition. I mean, it was never called the Sinai Peninsula. Um, but they find this mountain and they started, for whatever reason, we have no historical evidence uh, to understand or reason to believe, but they started believing this was Mount Sinai. Okay, so again, this is the fourth century. So they century. established a, a community there then. Yeah, they, they, exactly. And they would pray, they found some sort of grottos or caves and they would, they would tuck themselves in there and they would not talk, they would fast and pray. And then they would have, what, what would happen is they're called the, 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 sometimes they're called in history the Saracens. These are the Ishmaelites. These were sort of the, they were pagans. This is pre-Islam. They lived down there in the Sinai and they would come on and they would often kill the monks. The monks would get massacred. And so there was sort of a need for, you know, some protection. This went on for some time. But the first evidence that we have in history of anyone sort of validating the idea that this was Mount Sinai is a woman, she was a pilgrim. Uh, her name was Egeria. She came from Italy. And she went down there and she, she wrote a diary. It was called Peregrinatio. It uh, just means the pilgrimage. It's a very detailed uh, diary. And she t tells about how these monks showed her, showed her all of these locations and so forth and said, this is where the burning bush was. This is, you know, all they, they had these little ideas of what they thought. Well, if you go online today, you'll, you'll often see, they'll say that Constantine's mother, okay, so again, Emperor Constantine converts to some form of Christianity of some form, we don't know exactly what it was, but his mother also converted with him. She went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land to identify various relics and holy sites. And you see, the reason we know that is because the church historian Eusebius writes about it, okay? Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, a lot of people will say Helena is the one that put her stamp of approval on this mountain. Eusebius never mentions it. Eusebius never mentions it. The earliest record that we have that Helena went down to the Sinai is the 10th or 11th century. So even the idea that Helena validated it, that even that's probably a myth. So obviously- Right, so that's the fourth century, so the earliest record is, is uh, you know, 600 years later. Right, right, yeah. So, and this is the thing, with Jabal al-Laws, we have traditions that go back to the third century BC. We're talking 250 years before Jesus. With a traditional mm -hmm. site, we're skipping forward another 600 years before anything even shows up that we can even look at as a, as a tradition. So, I mean, in terms of these two positions, if we put them on the scale of evidence, the traditional site has nothing earlier than the Byzantine period. Um, and again, Th their tradition says that Helena designated it, but that doesn't work. So mm -hmm. then we skip forward to like the sixth century and these monks that are living down there, again, they keep getting killed by the Saracens, by the Ishmaelites. And so this is when Emperor Justinian says, we're gonna build St. Catherine's Monastery. Okay, so I've got some neat pictures here. And if anybody's gone down there, it's definitely an impressive place and it still sits there to this day. I mean, this is, this is now, 
um, the sixth century, sixth century, um, Emperor Justinian builds this. And, and what's so neat about this, look at this, just because I'm, I'm fascinated, these walls, some of them are 50 feet high. Okay, it was a fortress. Yeah. The whole thing was a fortress to protect the monks from these marauding bands of, of pagan Ishmaelites. And you know, in fairness to the traditional location, what they did, there's all sorts of rooms in there. They built a small basilica, a church. Um, in, in fairness to it, it's been a place of tremendous history. They've preserved all kinds of ancient uh, Christian icons and Christian documents. And again, I know we're not into icons, but they do preserve important bits of Christian history because they, these were essentially like the children's picture Bibles for the illiterate of the early days. And so there's, there's information there that you know, we can glean from, but this is where we get Codex um, Sinaiticus was discovered. And so it, it's got, a, it's got a, a rich history in terms of um, the preservation of biblical manuscripts. Okay, so we need to acknowledge that. But in terms of it being the real Mount Sinai, there's no evidence. There's nothing more than this myth that just crops up in the fourth century among some of these desert monks. And then once Emperor Justinian built St. Catherine's, now it's got the full stamp of approval of the Holy Roman Empire, right? Now you, you've got all of the weight of the Roman Empire behind it. And so people just start going with that. And, and I'll tell you, Michael, I actually believe, again, that in, in the providence and the sovereignty of God, that he allowed this to happen. He allowed a distraction. He, di he allowed a diversion because in all of this, he wanted to preserve the real mountain. He wanted to preserve the real one specifically as a testimony for the last days, as a testimony for the generation that we're living in, because it's before the return of Yeshua, it's before the day that has been appointed, whereby we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, that he has determined he is going to give the world a final, clear, crisp witness concerning the events that unfolded back on that holy mountain. Yeah, you think about it. Uh, underwater robotic dive cameras that were sent down in 2001 uh, among the coral encrusted remains of Pharaoh's chariots and army uh, strewn on the bottom of the, of the Yom Suf. You know, th this is the only generation that has developed that technology to be able to do that. Right. And uh, now uh, what, uh, what's going to be happening, people are gonna have a real treat. Uh, you know, I can't uh, give all the details now, but, uh, but there are going to be submarines that were going to be going down uh, on the bottom and uh, taking the submarines down there. So uh, they're gonna see this thing. So, uh, so, you know, preserving this for this day and time, now as you started out with the very first episode uh, talking about Neom, th this is incredibly important and, and uh, re rehearse again a little bit about what's, what's going on uh, in Saudi Arabia and why this is important to the Saudis and why the preservation of Mount Sinai and then the news of getting out to the world, why this may be one of the biggest things that ever happens uh, for the Saudi people and for that nation. Yeah, I mean, again, Saudi Arabia has been an economy that lives off of oil. You know, they export oil, they've lived in incredible wealth, they're running out of oil. They're aware of that, the new crown yeah. prince, uh, bin, bin Salman, Mohammed bin Salman, um, he recognizes that if Saudi, if the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is going to go on into the future, they need to diversify. And so he has all these ambitious projects, one of which is building this mega city state up there in the Tabuk province, right there on the Red Sea. He wants to build a big bridge across to Egypt. And by the way, it's oh, interesting. I didn't know about that. A, a bridge across the Yom Suf over yep. into Egypt? Yep. Okay. And you know, there's, there's other interesting things too because this is playing into the, the behind the scenes. We know behind the scenes there's been friendly relationships developing with Israel. Now again, the Saudis can't mm -hmm. broadcast that because they have to, maintain good relationships with the rest of the Muslim majority world that is surrounded by. But ultimately, whenever you intertwine economies, that's kind of a marriage. You can't, you can't just get out of that. You can't start spewing off anti-Semitism. So in a lot of ways, what's been going on behind the scenes is the Israelis, they have been in the early stages of planning and building a massive port. So what they were initially gonna do was build a five mile um, trench coming in from Elat that would meet at a massive high-speed 
train station that would then shoot over to um, south of Tel Aviv. But now what they're talking about is using the train station that will go up through Jordan and then cut over and go out to Haifa. Hmm. Okay, so essentially hmm. the, re- the Gulf of Aqaba now begins to compete with the Gulf of Suez. So now we're dealing with a major shift in, in a regional transport. We're dealing with big money. Saudis want to get in on that. And so this, this massive city up there of Neom, they want to get in on this new, essentially this new Gulf, uh, this new Gulf of Suez, you know, the, 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 the trench that you know, was built years ago. And so this, the Saudis are, are developing friendly relations with Israel, of course, friendly relations with Egypt, because they all have this mutual enemy of Iran. So mm-hmm. geopolitical, the, the landscape of the world right now is playing into this. The Saudis are almost forced, almost forced by the hand of God to build this city. And as a result, they're developing this whole area around Mount Sinai. And again, I just see the hand of, of Yehovah in all of this. He wants, he wants to turn the world's attention back to this mountain. Yeah. Now, I didn't want to uh, take you completely off track because we're, we're, we're dealing with uh, uh, the, the, the foe Sinai and the, the evidence there that Christian traditions uh, that go back all this time. Uh, we also have some Arabic uh, traditions that, that uh, uh, feed into this, though, do we not? Yeah, and so in, um, I guess at the end of the last program, last week, we were touching on this because, again, you begin, you know, as we just said, you have nothing earlier than Byzantine traditions to establish the traditional site. With Jabal al-Laws, you go all the way back to 3rd century BC. The Septuagint names this city over there in Saudi Arabia and calls it Madium. We know that's Midian. It's a subtle variation. Then you have Philo is saying, Sinai is the tallest mountain outside of that town. Josephus says the same thing. We have every reason to believe that Paul would have believed the same thing. We'll talk some more about that. Mm -hmm. But then after that, you had Demetrius, you had Origen, you had Eusebius, and Jerome. Now these guys were writing during the same period that Justinian is building St. Catharines and so forth, but they didn't agree with that site. This is important. Oh, well. You have these early church, very well-known mm-hmm. writers, Jerome Eusebius, and they were still validating Mount Sinai over here in Saudi Arabia. Now again, Eusebius was not deceived by Ron Wyatt. Eusebius is not a time traveler. This is an ancient Jewish tradition that they were, that they were carrying on. Now you mm-hmm. skip forward, okay, Jerome is, uh, is fifth century. Now you skip forward another 200, uh, 100 plus years to the time of Muhammad and these early Arab Muslim historians, they say that there were all these Christian monks living in the mountains around Jabal al-Laz. They call them anchorites, they're like hermits. These were, again, aesthetics. So you had some monks that believed the traditional site, but you had a whole bunch of Christian monks that still knew where the real Mount Sinai was. And so then the Quran carries on this tradition and it refers to Jethro, it uses the name Shu'aib, it's a strange variation, but they refer to the land of Midian up there as the land of Moses, as the land of Shu'aib. They talk about the well of Moses, they talk about the caves of Jethro. And so all of these traditions that are started out as Jewish traditions, they were carried on by the early Christians, they were picked up by Muslims, and today as a result, All of the locals in the area still believe this is the real Mount Sinai. This is a tradition that is over 2,000 years old. That's uh, that, that, that's incredible. The uh, now let, let's uh, g- get into this, un- unpack this uh, concerning Paul and his his position as uh, as stated. Sure, and this is a biggie. And you know, in fact, in the book that I'm working on on this, I take a whole chapter just to deal with Paul, mm-hmm. because obviously he is a looming giant witness in all of this. Mm-hmm. And so Paul um, he makes two references. The only reference uh, to Arabia in the New Testament, both in Galatians. One is in chapter one, uh, the other is in chapter four. So in chapter one, Paul lays out the story of his conversion. You know, and again, you touched on it. He was exceedingly zealous for the traditions of his fathers. And in a lot of ways, Paul's life has many similarities to Elijah. Elijah was the prophet of zeal, you know, Phineas, the prophet of zeal. And Paul defines himself as exceedingly zealous to the point where he was going around killing the early believers, right? Mm -hmm. Killing the early Messianic Jews. When you think about this, you know, if you just put this in context, you go, hey, did you hear the story about this young Messianic Jewish believer? 
um, glowing face young guy was serving in his congregation. Did you hear the story? He was stoned to death by some Orthodox Hasidic Jews in the streets of Jerusalem. You know, you go, what are you talking about? You go, yeah, you know, and this one guy was standing there holding the cloaks of all the guys that did it. He had papers from the authorities to let it happen. His name was Saul. You know what I mean? This, this is who he was. He was killing, he was, he was behind the killing of Stephen, one of the, one of the most Holy Spirit-filled early believers. And so, you know, he had, when, when he had this revelation of Yeshua, he had some repenting to do. But yeah. So it's, it's interesting yeah. that he, he has this conversion. And, and the thing of it is, is Paul gets knocked off his, his horse. He didn't just become a 21st century evangelical Christian overnight, right? <laughs> he, had, he had some, you know, it says he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a lifelong, uh, zealously observed Torah. And so all of a sudden, you know, he has a revelation. Okay, who are you, Lord? I'm the one that you're persecuting. Okay, wait, Yeshua, and everything's upside down. But what he says is this. He makes an important statement. He goes, listen, when this happened, he goes, I didn't go to Jerusalem. I didn't go consult with the other apostles. And he reiterates a few points. Mm -hmm. He says, I didn't consult any flesh. I didn't consult the apostles. I didn't consult any other human. And then he says, instead, I went to Arabia. I went to Arabia. And so there's a very clear inference here. The inference, when he is contrasting, I didn't consult flesh, the inference is, I consulted God. Where? In Arabia. In mountain. And so commentators, again, Christian commentators, they have three options. They say, well, Paul went to Arabia to evangelize. And I go, he probably, he's Paul. He probably did do some of it. He probably preached a bit. He's always stirring up trouble. I go, okay, I allow for that. And there's some evidence of it, because in 2 Corinthians, it says that when Paul was in Damascus, later, years later, that Aratus, who was the king of the Nabataean Arabs, he actually sent someone up there to get him. I go, okay, so Paul probably caused some trouble when he was down there. But the other option is that he just vaguely went to Arabia, no reason at all, just to seek solitude. I go, he specified Arabia for a reason. Mm -hmm. And the third option is that he went to Arabia, which is to Mount Sinai. He went to the place where Torah was given. He went to the place where the God that he had so zealously served his whole life had come down. And in imitation of Moses, in imitation of Elijah, he went to the mountain to hear the voice of God. And he goes on, Paul says, and that's where I received my gospel. I received it by revelation. It's, it's the most reasonable. He doesn't come right out and say it. So we can't say with absolute confidence, but it is absolutely the most reasonable uh, option that we have is that Paul the Apostle received his gospel on Mount Sinai. With all the evidence, with uh, you know, knowing human nature the way we do after having lived uh, uh, and, and having had things to repent for, certainly not murder in, in, right. in our cases, boy, but this it only makes sense. You, you play out the movie with the evidence that's in the scripture and there's only one thing that makes sense. You go down to Mount Sinai, and this is a time of bitter repentance for yeah. him. Yeah. You know, he's just, you guys got through killing people. And now he's going down there and not to, not to consult with flesh and blood. Right. You know, yeah. he went down there to consult with the Almighty, and that's when Yeshua, by his Holy Spirit, uh, puts things in him that turns his life completely around. Because, you know, you, you, we have to understand that, that, that Shaul, Paul, he wasn't with Yeshua, he wasn't traveling with him. He doesn't have uh, the, the, the wealth of information of traveling with him uh, during the, the several months, basically about nine months of what the fishermen uh, mm -hmm. did. And so he's gotta get this, this gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua is preaching where uh, Yeshua is deliberately and vehemently violating the rules and regulations of the Pharisees at every turn, everything that he says, everything he does, he is putting the knife blade down between the traditions and commandments of men, which the Phariseeism is made of, yep. and what does Moses say? So he went back to the mountain of Moses, the only thing that makes sense, and that because that he has got to have that clarity. Mm -hmm. And the clarity that he is then going to be able to express this to Gentiles who are not raised in the Torah. Right. It's going to take a master of the Torah to be able to 
make this known to the Gentiles, and then they're gonna, they're, they're gonna twist his words and, and mess it all up <laughs> eventually like we have today. Yeah. yeah, and this is the thing, I mean, Paul is so well known for articulating, admittedly at times, fairly complex, very nuanced, um, you know, uh, teachings concerning the relation of Torah and grace. And in order to understand what he's saying, we need to get into his world, into his mind, again, as a first right. century Pharisee of Pharisees. And it may even have been, this is kind of a, an interesting curveball, it may even have been there at Sinai that the Lord revealed to him that Sinai is no longer the mountain of glory, if you will. It's that it's Zion that he will rule from. And so then later in chapter four, when Paul kind of says, well, Mount Sinai represents Hagar and she's in bondage, it's almost like the, you know, the, this, this thing that Paul may have almost idolized previously in his life, the Lord said, now here's a little more nuanced understanding because here's what I'm going to do, that the glory, if you will, will rest on Zion, that that's where it's all gone. And, and so there's this sort of picture in the prophets of God coming from Sinai Mm, and he's mm. going up to Zion. Yeah, yeah. The the place where the ark was built at Sinai, but that the ark is the throne of the king, which he will rule from Jerusalem, from that throne in Jerusalem. It, it, it's just it, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love it. There's so many. There's so many awesome parallels back at Sinai the glory cloud, God speaks from heaven and he says, this angel of the Lord, he says, listen to him because my name is in him. Mm -hmm. And then later Yeshua comes and a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. You know, Deuteronomy 18, the prophet like Moses, you're gonna listen to him. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's yea, he's the prophet like Moses, yea, he is the angel of God, my name is in him, he is Yehovah in the flesh. We are back with Shaul and Yoel, Paul and Joel in the book of Galatians and unpacking uh, his revelation concerning Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And, and Mount Sinai. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, as we touched on in the last segment is in chapter one, uh, Paul makes this statement, you know, he goes, hey, uh, you know, after my conversion, I went to Arabia and as I said, this is, there's only two places in the New Testament where the word Arabia is used. They're both right here in Galatians. Mm -hmm. And the other one, and this is huge, is in chapter four. And so I'm actually gonna read um, most of the, the passage because it's so important. And you know, again, this is a passage typical of Paul you can't just read it and get it. You know, you need to kind of read it and chew on it. And you know, there's a lot of meat in here and you mm -hmm. need a bit of a background. Mm -hmm. but. He says, it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. The son by the free woman through the promise. Skipping forward a little bit, he says, and you brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time he was born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall never be an heir with the son of the free woman. Now, right in the middle of that, I actually skipped over it, but right in the middle of that in verse 25, Paul goes, for Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Okay, now, as you can imagine, this is a, a point of great consternation for the traditionalists, because they go, well, wait a minute, we're trying to say that Mount Sinai is not in Arabia, and you guys are saying it is over there in Saudi Arabia. So basically here is the argument that has come up. The traditionalists say in Paul's day, the Sinai Peninsula would have clearly been recognized as part of Arabia. Now I want you to follow this bad logic because I agree with them. I agree that the Sinai Peninsula, much of it probably would have been viewed as Arabia. But they go, therefore, Paul clearly was referring to the Sinai. Okay, that second statement does not logically follow the first. You go, among all of the various ways that Paul could have understood the term Arabia, they go, Sinai would have been included in that. It would have been one of the ways. And they go, therefore, that's what he must have believed. You go, hold on, you haven't given a single reason why he would have believed that of all the options. And so, you know, very simply, and again, this is, this is simple common sense, but again, scholars have a way, not all of them, but I'll call it intellectual bullying. 
You know, if they just throw out an insult, like anyone who doesn't believe this is ridiculous, and you go, oh, I don't wanna be ridiculous. You know, and all of a sudden, you, mm-hmm. your, your logical thought just goes out the door. Paul would have been, his understanding of Arabia would have been influenced first by the Bible, okay, because that was everything that defined who he was, second by the very common, well-known Jewish traditions of his day, because he would have been first and foremost informed by his identity as a Pharisee, a Pharisee, as a Jew, a first century Jew. Mm -hmm. And so where does the Bible place Mount Sinai? It places it, we've already talked about it, east of the Yam Suf, east of the Gulf of Aqaba. Paul would have understood that. Okay, so that's easy enough. Second, he would have been influenced by the Jewish traditions of his day. We've already discussed these. The Septuagint, Philo, Josephus, they all place Mount Sinai over there in Saudi Arabia, east of the Gulf of Aqaba. And we have no reason in the world, no reason, and and these, these traditionalists never give us a reason to suggest that Paul disagreed with them. We have no evidence, we have no reason. Now, then the third factor that could have influenced Paul would have been the very common Greco-Roman designations of his day. And so that's what they focus on. They'll focus all on Herodotus and Strabo and Pliny the Elder and so forth and and Claudius Ptolemy and all these Greco-Roman geographers and historians, but -hmm. they don't talk about what the Bible says. And so I go, okay, you wanna go there, you wanna talk about Herodotus and all that. You wanna talk about the various ways in which Paul could have understood the term Arabia. Let's talk about it. So the first way that Paul could have understood it, it's actually used in the book of Acts, incredibly broad. Uh, it's at Pentecost, and we have the list. He goes, there were, there, were, there were Jews and proselytes there, so there's both Jews and pro- Gentile co- proselytes, and he goes, they're from, they were Elamites, they were um, from Mesopotamia, there's Persians, and so they're all, all over here from the area of Iraq and Kurdistan and Iran. And then he goes, and then there's, you know, there's those from Asia Minor, he lists the Cappadocians and all these, and and there's all these different Westerners. He's talking about the Jews of the dispersion, of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And then he summarizes the whole thing. He says both Arabs and Cretans. The, the, The point behind this is that he uses the word Arab to encompass everyone of the Eastern diaspora. He uses the term Cretan to refer to everyone of the Western diaspora. So, we, here's an example from the Bible. In the first century, Arab could just mean those from the East. It could be used very broadly. We go, that's one way it could have been used. Then you have the ways that the Greco-Roman uh, geographers could have used it, and this was any area outside of Israel where Arabs lived. And that could have been the Sinai Peninsula, it could have been Arabia proper, that's mm-hmm. the Arabian Peninsula, it could have been all the way up there to Damascus. Okay, so we acknowledge that. We go, it could have been used very broadly, But, and here's the point, there also, in the midst of this, always was an original Arabia proper. And so I just use this analogy. I go, guys, let's just say, let's say I use the phrase, make America great again. God bless America. Everyone in our context, in our day, they know that I'm talking about the United States of America. Not South America. Not Canada, not Mm -hmm. North America, not Costa Rica, not Brazil, not Argentina. Mm -hmm. However, a scholar 2,000 years from now, he could say, well, in Joel's day, when he said make America great again, technically Argentina was part of America. Therefore, that's clearly what he was referring to. No, it's not. Great example. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly how Arabia was used. There was was an Arabia proper. If you Mm -hmm. look at a map of Herodotus, the world according to Herodotus, it was the Arabian Peninsula that was Arabia. Mm -hmm. You look at Strabo, he referred to that as Arabia Felix, and then he had Arabia Deserta, which was up there in southern Jordan going down into Saudi Arabia. But the original heart of Arabia. Okay, so all of those things, you go, Paul would have been referring to Arabia proper. If he doesn't specify, then we would probably go to Arabia proper. Plus, the Bible puts us there, Jewish tradition puts us there. And then finally, we look at the context of Paul's statements. What's he talking about? He's not just making some dry Greco Roman geographic designation, he's making a very nuanced, very spiritual, you could even say rabbinic argument. He's mm-hmm. talking about cast out the bondwoman and the slave woman and Hagar and Ishmael. He's talking about the descendants of Hagar and Ishmael and where they came geographically to settle. So where did Ishmael's children come to settle? Nabioth, 
he settled down there in Saudi Arabia, and in southern Jordan, Saudi Arabia. Nabaioth, this was Ishmael's first son, he was the father of the modern day Nabataeans, Nabataean Arabs, that's where they lived, from Petra all the way down to Maidin Salah, 400 miles into Saudi Arabia. That's where the children of Ishmael came to settle. Kedar, Duma, they all settled in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so, so the point is that Paul was making a very biblical argument. And if we look at the context of what Paul was saying, where did the children of Ishmael come to settle? It's down there in Arabia. It's not primarily over there in the Sinai Peninsula. Did some of them eventually end up over there? I'm sure they did. But again, we have to look at the context of Paul's statement the context of Paul's worldview, and all of the options. So even if you wanna go there and, and go into those arguments with the traditionalists, all of the weight of evidence points to Saudi Arabia. It doesn't point to the Sinai Peninsula. And so they have a very weak argument. All evidence points to the fact that Paul agreed with Josephus, agreed with Philo, agreed with the Septuagint, and of course, agreed with the scriptures. And that Paul would have recognized Jubal laws to be Mount Sinai, and that's most likely the place that Paul went after, G after Yeshua knocked him off his horse. Yeah. And then we have uh, uh, Mount Sinai in Jerusalem, which is on the same longitudinal plain, directly north. A answer to or is uh, on, on the same plain as Mount Sinai, and you can draw a line right straight from, from, Mount, uh, uh, from Mount Moriah in, in Jerusalem right down to Mount Sinai. Yeah, it's bizarre, and this is, um, Jim and Penny Caldwell did this, they, they took Google World or Maps or whatever it's called, and they did a direct north point, actually from the Split Rock, and they shot up directly north and they land right on the Temple Mount. I mean, you know, that's pretty darn specific. That's like within feet, that mm -hmm. it is perfectly right on that. Because it says that Jerusalem above right. corresponds to Mount Sinai. And, and you know, it, it, you kind of go, well, what does that mean exactly? But it actually, in the original language, can be used to say it's directly north of. And so that's another just sort of fascinating, when they laid that out and all of a sudden it lands right there, you go, whoa, that's... Yeah, and so either either Paul is uh, mistaken or he is a man who is inspired by the Holy Spirit and he's writing as he is inspired and he has a, a, a detail uh, which uh, now can be found on Google Maps with absolute precision. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't think he had any access to Google Maps back I don't, then I don't, I don't, uh, I to be able had, to make that statement. I, I think he had something much better than Google Maps. <laughs> get something much better. No, I mean, this is where we are, is, you know, when it's all laid out, when all the evidence is laid out, I think it's settled. I think it's absolutely settled. Mount Sinai, I, I haven't discovered it. It's been, it's been sitting there all along. Mm -hmm. You know, Ron Wyatt is the first guy in modern history to have begun bringing attention back to it. But all along, the Muslims knew where it was, the early Christians knew where it was, the ancient Jews knew where it was, but the Lord has purposefully hidden it, and now in our day, now in our day, we can say with confidence, the debate is over, the, the, the conflict is over, we know where Mount Sinai is, and it's about to be opened up to the world. And this is the hand of God. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that, that happened with Wyatt, which is uh, uh, very instructive on, on this, is that uh, when Wyatt went, went in there, uh, he, he crossed the, uh, the desert in Jordan, middle of the night, and uh, hired taxis to get him down to this location that, that Jim Irwin could see by satellite, uh, because of the NASA satellites, could see that this, this fits the, the location. And all the biblical records, everything fit, and so uh, he made his way in, and, uh, and then he got captured on the way back. Okay. And, uh, and Ron was careful to tell me this. He said um, why he was captured on the way back is he told two people. One of them was an archeologist, the other one was Jim Irwin. He said, we are going in, and this is, this is how we're going to approach it, and then we're gonna go out this way. And so he said that that archeologist he was the one that alerted the Saudis and had him arrested mm. uh, and said that there were two Israeli spies that were in the country and this is where they're they going to be able to catch them. Mm. And so this archeologist 
uh, not Jim Irwin again. Jim Irwin is an honorable, uh, he was a Christian man, he was uh, one of the moon uh, astronauts. Uh, he was the one that, that, uh, uh, that was entrusted with the information. The other one n thought, you know, I, I surmise that if he could get Ron Wyatt killed, then he would get the, the uh, mm -hmm. credit. The, the, yeah, he'd get the credit for this thing. And so uh, while this really came to, to national attention is that when he was captured and he was held in Arabian prison, this is when the United States, the State Department went in and they were trying to get him freed. Mm. 76 days he spent in prison over there and it made national news in America. Mm. It, without that national news, Ron Wyatt and this uh, foray into Mount Sinai and into Arabia wouldn't have had any traction at all. But because it made national news, that's why it came into the forefront. Mm -hmm. And so those who want to say, oh, he did it illegally, it's like, oh, you moral, you know, you know, you know get on your moral high horse. Mm -hmm. he, he did it illegally because he couldn't get a, uh, a visa into the country after years of trying. And now you're going to say that, oh, we live on such a high plane uh, that, that anyone who enters Ill illegally, we have to disprove or discredit everything that he does. Right. You know, that is so dishonest. And just like the archeologist that, that got him captured and, and told him where they would find him. And so, you know, uh, you know I, I, don't, uh, name, I don't name the person, but, uh, um, but it is instructive. This, this is the world of archeology. span This is the world of science. It's whatever you have to do to get ahead, watch the money, watch the notoriety, and that's where you're gonna find the deceit. Yeah, it's amazing. I, you know, people always ask me, hey, Joel, with all you do, you know, don't you have radical Muslims want to kill you? And I go, you know, I'll be honest with you, my biggest dangers that I face are betrayals by fellow brothers and sisters who disagree with me on some strange point of eschatology and then they want to go after me and attack me. And it's just really strange, you know. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I reach out to these Christian scholars, these Christian archaeologists in my book, and I say, look, let's treat this with dignity. Let's not, let's not go down this dirty road of attacking ad hominem attacks. Let's give this thing the, the, the uh, inspection. You know, let's, let's examine this in the way that it deserves because the stakes are too high. The potential of what this is, from their perspective, I believe it with all my heart, mm -hmm. but it, even if it's potentially the mountain, they should treat it. I mean, when, when the Israelites approached it, they approached it in fear and reverence. And we've, in modern times, have approached it, modern scholarship has approached it just the opposite. They've, they've treated it very lightly, and that's a fearful, fearful thing. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's look at the, this thing. You, you were there at the Split Rock. We've got the, the photographs, you've, you've been there. Moses was told there at, uh, at Sinai, before uh, Sinai, at, at Rephidim, to strike the rock. That's what he was told the first time. Years later, before going into the Promised Land, he was told to declare the rock, not speak under the rock, but declare the rock. And, and, and Shaul, Paul, details this. He, 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 he says what this is about. He said, that rock is a Messiah. Yeah. That rock is a Messiah who is to be smitten once, but afterward be declared. And because Moses did not declare the rock, did not declare the Messiah, mm -hmm. he was not allowed to go in the promised land after a lifetime of, of service. Yeah. He, he was, he and Aaron were both rejected. They were not allowed to go in the promised land. And this is how uh, seriously I treat, treat, treat this, that the feast of the Lord are these prophetic shadow pictures. Yeah. The rock is a prophetic shadow picture. Yeah. And if you destroy that prophetic shadow picture because of your own anger, you trying to protect your denomination or anything, it's like Moses, you're not going into the promised land. This is a, a violation against what, what the Almighty is doing in revealing these things for this day and time. And everyone needs to get on the board, on board with Jim and Penny and 
earnestly pray that this yes. is protected. Yeah. Earnestly pray that this is revealed to the entire world. They have been praying and fasting mm-hmm. uh, on this for decades. Yeah. We've been working on this. I've been trying to get the message out for, for decades now. And it's like, this is our opportunity. And to just uh, take the, these uh, the DVDs and, and, and chuff them away instead of spending it on it to, to friends and neighbors and telling people about it, instead of hiding this, this is our opportunity to declare the rock. Amen. This is it. Amen. Joel, we, we oh, yeah, I, I know that you had a near death experience uh, out there. You know, uh, we just don't have time to do it right now. Um, my, my goodness, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this, uh, th- this has been such a treat. I wanna have Joel back. You know, he was with us for Passover. Uh, one of our favorite teachings at Passover uh, was uh, uh, what, what we have renamed Yeshua's Threshing Tour. That's not what Joel named it. But, but uh, to, to go with, with Joel as he really uh, walks us through Yeshua's return and delivering the captives and finally going from Sinai all the way to Jerusalem where he will be enthroned on the Ark of the Covenant, which is the throne of the, th- the, the future king as Yeshua reigns as Yehovah Tzavot from his throne in Jerusalem. He took us on that trip. You gotta get back uh, in- into that. Uh, s- spread this good news out to the world, ladies and gentlemen. This is the hour that is uh, the most important hour that uh, that we will ever live through in our lives. We weren't there at Mount Sinai, we weren't, weren't there with Yeshua, but we are here when Almighty God is making known the greatest treasures, the rocks are literally crying out because his people have not cried out. It's our turn to get in league with the Most High and teach and preach the gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua preached, and we're gonna get it out to the entire world. We'd like to close in prayer. Abba Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together. We thank you for preserving Joel's life. We thank you for preserving his testimony, for all the things that that he has been able to come out of Arabia with to share with the world. We thank you for uh, blessing Jim and Penny Caldwell for the years of work that they put into it. We thank you for blessing Ron Wyatt's children who, who have uh, remained in the background for, for all these years, but they, they too ha- have seen these things and, and they've seen their, their father maligned uh, with, with the most vehement and, and vicious lies being told about them by those who call themselves Christians and believers. Uh, anything to keep uh, and preserve the, the, the fallacy of Constantine's mother finding the real Mount Sinai. All, all, all this that has been done, we ask that you bless them and that everything that, that, that has been taken away from them will, will be restored to them. Uh, that, that you will bless them in the blessings that they need from heaven. And I speak this blessing over them, over Joel, over the Caldwells, uh, and, and putting your name upon your people because you said you will hear from heaven, and that you will bless. And we don't know what blessings they need, but you know what they need in their lives. And so I'm speaking this blessing not under the authority of the Aaronic priesthood, but under a higher authority, under the authority of the high priest forever, after the order of the Melchizedek, Yeshua, the high priest forever, who has made us priests and kings. Yivarechecha Yehovah, Vayishmerecha. Yair Yehovah panavelecha v'chanecha. Isa Yehovah panavelecha v'esem lecha shalom. V'shem Yeshua HaMashiach sar shalom. Thank you for being with us, Joel. Thank you for being with us, all of, all of you who have uh, uh, keyed in on this special uh, treat here. And we'll see you next time on Shabbat Night Live. Good night.